Thank you, everybody, for joining the FLVS 2020, the second day. Uh, this is the Blockchain Governance and Crypto Lab, where we are going to be elaborating the legal issues, the concepts and theories, uh, purpose, and possibly even propose and review some crypto laws, um, or at least the broader concept of it, and the blockchain interventions that we can do in the future. Um, we are being joined by John Haskell and Andrea Leiter, both doctors, both professors. Um, also on the call with us, there is Vlad Zafir, Morshid Manan, and Anush Dasgupta. And we now have Juan Carlos Bellinas. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, and we are going to be running this lab for 90 minutes up until 10.45 Central European time, which is to be distinguished between Central European summertime, which is still going <laughs> on um, and it caused a lot of issues on our side. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, Go for it. Today, John and Andrea, you're going to be moderating us through. Welcome. Perfect. Well, uh, let me pass the floor to my... Uh, Audrey, would you like to actually be our, our leader today, maybe? Sure. Um, so, yeah. Good morning, everyone. And um, uh, we discussed earlier that we would very much like to just use this session to try and think a little bit um, what are the what are some of the assumptions that are held um, in crypto law broadly conceived and how could we think about them differently or what is at stake with withholding them so the idea um, that John and I had was to try to work through like a, a, a pattern of questions so what does someone, what does a group claim about a certain thing? Um, what do you think is wrong with that? Or what do they not see, what you see? And then what would you suggest to do differently? And why does that matter, basically? So an example of this could be, and I think maybe um, we can jump on the question of yesterday that we did, that Vlad introduced um, um, beautifully, the question of immutability, because I think Vlad did exactly this. And, and um, so I think just to, to bring it into this into this scheme explicitly would be to say, well, everyone says um, immutability is the main feature of blockchain technology. However, if you look at this, then you will see that this is actually not very true because if it comes to the technical aspects of the blockchain, there are upgrades that are being made all the time. Um, and when it comes to political or social questions or things that are being labeled as political and social, then the idea of immu immutability has big purchase. So instead of just talking about immu immutability generally, we should actually see where is this idea of immutability applied and where is it applied how because if we do that then we will be much more able to come up with better governance schemes another, or something another, like that another, another relevant thing that came to mind to me is like why are people using this idea like what's the kind of telos here like what's the what's the motivation behind this group pushing forward this legal form in this context yeah, so I mean, I think that that ties up a little bit, I think, in that. So another another thing that I that I think that so I don't know how you went with the conversation yesterday, but I thought that another issue that is interesting where we can think about that ties into this is precisely with the question of a legality. So this this big claim of blockchain having to be a space that should ideally be left um, alone by state regulation and that the immutability plays a big part in that. Um, um, and and then um, a challenge to that would be to say, well, okay, a legality is maybe a term that is very that is very empty. Like throwing out all the law also means that you throw out all kinds of legal regimes that have been um, fought for with blood and tears in all sorts of social aspects, labor mm -hmm. law. Um, non-discrimination laws, all this was not given and granted by someone who just thought that's a good idea that was literally fought for on the streets. So what is this What is this idea of throwing out law, throwing it out completely? So maybe we need to have a much more refined approach to thinking what kind of elements of state regulation um, are, are cumbersome and um, um, should maybe be 
kept at bay as much as possible, but what other mechanisms of social ordering do we actually have established in legal regimes that have grown for centuries that would probably be a bad idea to throw out the window. And then there's this other question of like, what, to what extent is it even possible to be illegal? You know, like you could try, but like, I mean, it's just like analytically doesn't, it's not possible. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is also something I think if you spin this a legality thing in a different way, then you would say, okay, people say blockchain is a space of a legality. And then when you then you can say, okay, what what do you think a legality can mean? Because law in a broad conception would mean normativity, would mean some mechanism of rule ordering that functions and that um, that somehow um, um, uh, orders behavior. So what can I, illegality even mean? What does I, 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 I think it's interesting because, you know, like the blockchain communities are obviously not the first to use the term illegality uh, as a as a way of uh, understanding the law. And I think there are two uh, major books that came out in recent years on illegality, which I think are really interesting to explore in uh, connection to this discussion as well. Like one of them uh, came out from Oxford University Press and which uh, by Linda, Hans Linda. Yeah. And the other one came out, which is from a, not from a legal scholar, but from something, a context that might be completely uh, in a way, uh, in some ways very different from what we're talking about, but I think it's analytically very interesting to look at. And that, uh, that book is called A Legal, which is by a scholar in uh, NYU looking at um, the relations between um, between uh, American communities, uh, military communities in Japan in Okinawa, um, with their local the, the local Japanese population, and how um, over decades this relationship was not. Uh, permissive uh, b because of the fact that, um, you know, let's say the military was not supposed to interact with the local population, but they ended up developing family ties and so on, often in very violent ways too. Um, and so it, it, this illegal concept was a way of trying to understand the, the relations, the property relations, the family relations that emerged um, in these spaces. And I think it's uh, interesting because I think we end up coming um, to this idea that maybe what we are describing as illegal is really trying to understand something um, that, for instance, is being discussed in like the, the broader literature about uh, how to deal with uh, personal laws or how to deal with um, laws concerning um, how communities self-govern where the state is very weak. Um, and I think that, of course, like in the, like the literature on like, let's say, neoliberalism, there is uh, a discussion about this too. So it, I, I think it's interesting, like how maybe we don't think of it just as illegal as being the absence of law, laws, an inability to extend violence or something to a certain space or control property relations, but we maybe embed it in this um, in, in, in like, let's say the, the older discussions on uh, illegality and see where we can um, tease out similarities. Morsha, or that's, that's really interesting to me. Thank you for that. Uh, one, I just wanted to make two observations. One is that it's interesting. So how a format that Andrea just raised can immediately just spark this conversation and how it's already going in different directions. And, yeah. and but it's before we unleash the you know the doors and like really get into it i just wanted to pull back and just settle into something andrea uh said and then uh and then turn it back to andrea then open it up and that's that and i wanted to use more thing maybe and vlad's thing that they just said as a response to give an example of that if that's okay so the idea is like more it would be so interesting as well before we just get loose and start talking if you could frame what you said in those four sentences. So understanding, can I tell someone what I want to say in 30 seconds rather than three minutes? Can I really refine it to a place where everyone can understand? The, and that's why the four sentence or the one sentences there is to emphasize like how we talk as a way of respect for how we can listen. 
the... uh, 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 could you just uh, tell me again what the first sentence would be so i i put i oh. just posted them in the chat because i thought maybe that's easier and it's yeah. really so yeah john do you want to do you want to i'll give you an example like just of what we're talking about right now so i just wrote it like as we were like going and i was like okay so here will be an example of what we're now i understand mm -hmm. what i'm going to say is not what everyone agrees was exactly said because i'm going to frame it in a certain way right and you could frame it differently you know that you know what i mean and we could do the same thing with the one sentence until now you thought this but let me tell you boom right something like that so and the idea would be that this is like we get in the elevator and there's like that significant other that we've always liked and they say so what are you working on you're like start sweating and you're like you got 30 seconds and you tell them what you're working on and then you get out and it's the cocktail bar and they say you want to get a cocktail and you have five minutes now. And so you're gonna talk a little bit longer about your thing. And then you end up smoking a cigarette on the back mm. patio of the party and you have 20 minutes and you're gonna talk longer. You know, So we need mm. like a 30 second, a five minute and a longer discussion that we could have. So I'm just gonna do that 30 second one. So here would be an example. People in the crypto space often see themselves as bringing in more democratic forms of governance. Sentence one, what, what a certain group of people tend to be doing. While money design, uh, while focusing on money design as a central attribute of how you develop a society is often missed and that's very appreciated. Uh, too often, these communities end up reinforcing the very undemocratic forces and institutional hierarchies that they sought to avoid. That's my provocation. That's the problem. So what I'm trying to do is bring in heterodox and past theories of political economy and law uh, uh, and my hope is so that's what I would do instead, right? Now notice I'm, I'm trying to, care, like I've reached out an olive branch by saying we agree on money design. I'm gonna be focusing on that. I've, I've sort of like positioned myself as an academic by saying I'm gonna deal with alternative and right, like past theories. So like I'm, I'm making choices of how I'm posturing right now that maybe I would do differently in different contexts. And, and my hope is that it opens up new policy space to make good on uh, all the energy and ideas of crypto, right, uh, towards a more democratic society. So, so a, another example of this is, um, till now, you might have thought decentralization led to freedom. But actually, I want to show it leads to standardization. And it just routinizes uh, and gets captured by established hierarchies. So that would be like a provocative sentence to put on the table that then we could unpack. So mm -hmm. what, so these are just uh, two examples. Andrea, is that, I mean, maybe, maybe you have a- No, different. no, I mean, it's exactly that. So I think that, that we could just see, I mean, the, 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 the idea was that or we, we didn't know exactly how many people we will, we will be and how, how we will go about it. Um, the reason for banging on this like um, system of these four questions is just because somehow it allows the conversation to be, so you can you can have an, a, an easy takeaway if you try to press yourself into this format and really then you, you kind of force yourself to get to the point of what you want to say. And we thought that that would be a good way of going through this conversation here. And I think, yeah, John put out two examples. Um, I, I think, um, yeah, really Vlad did this more or less yesterday anyways in his proposition. Um, then there is the then there is a, a question you can talk about. I don't know, another provocation would be to say um, in the blockchain space, the idea that there are no intermediaries is very prominent. The idea is that you cut out the, the, the middleman. However, if I look at my engagement with the crypto world, I need an exchange, I need a wallet, I need a hard storage, I need all sorts of things in order to be able to interact in this space. So what I would suggest is to say, rather than saying there are no intermediaries, one could say there are now different intermediaries that operate with a different economic logic, possibly, that operate within a different power structure. But if we look at it as other intermediaries, rather than no intermediaries, we, we can see what kind of power um, structures are actually set up in the crypto economy. So, so yeah. and, 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 
and, and, and also like kind of like what what's the difference like why do people prefer this mediation in some cases to yeah. like the normal you know mediation by like the people they're used to and the services they're used to Exactly. Like, how does it change? It's not the idea that that it's completely false what is being claimed, but how does it change? Like, if you say, okay, I'd rather go with whatever this platform, whatever Zora, to uh, do a distribution of uh, tokens for me. What is that? How is that different than going through a different platform? Why would I choose to go there? What kind of cut is in there for me? Who else gets a cut? I mean, you can you can do that in a in economic terms, or you can do that in like. Uh, social terms of who are these people who are advancing this so so I think these are all really a lot of um, a lot of um, different provocations I think the question now would be how do we go from here what do we do now with all these provocations I don't know if people want to throw in other provocations to the table and then we can just as, as John said we can just let I'm, it I'm, open I'm provoked enough I, I can't I, I... I can't deal there's too too much unresponded to pro provocative stuff <laughs> and before we uh as we launch into this and andrew what a nice example just personally i really enjoyed it like listening to this exchange right now uh um we have three more people that just entered the room and was just wondering if real briefly if uh grace naveen and rj could would like to say hi and just uh tell us uh where you're coming from kind of Cool. Uh, should I fill in this question as I introduce myself? That, that, you, that could be a great, if we wanted our three new colleagues just to give it a shot, if they want to as well, to put it on the table and then we'll, uh, Andre, does that, does that sound? Yeah, like anyone, however you like. I think, Grace, if you, if, if that, if that sounds good to you, I would be very curious to hear, but I think it's a no must. Um, so I'm Grace Rahmani. Um, I live not too far from Anya and I'm traveling in Europe right now. And what people are doing in the area of cryptocurrency right now is um, making new forms of money. And John even mentioned this idea of money design. Um, I've been taking it a little bit further to the idea of currency design, which is any current you can see. And I'm working um, with eco villages to try and create pools rather than marketplaces where people share rather than have a tit for tat economy and this really matters today because i'm thinking about this as the life support systems of humans on earth and that we shouldn't have to trade or work certainly children shouldn't have to when it comes to having our basic needs met so my i'm postulating this thing called pools which should be divided among all other people all people as life support systems sort of underneath the marketplace before we can trade everybody should eat that's what i'm up to Thank you, Grace. That's really cool. Like that would be interesting to unpack more. Uh, how about Naveen? You you mentioned something. Hey, y'all. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, I'm an independent analyst. I've been in the crypto space for a while, uh, working on creating a standard metadata profile for most crypto projects. Uh, and very interested in token engineering and these sorts of power analyses to create like a standard metadata template for these projects. That's what I've been doing. Very cool. And we have one more colleague with us, I think. Oh, did RJ leave? Grace, I think uh, uh, you and Naveen have scared off RJ. Or maybe it was us. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, that's all I, I was just interrupting the space because I was just curious who else was here and wanted to say welcome. Does anyone want to take up Andrea's provocation to throw something on the table and we go from glad you had some things or somebody else um yeah i'm just let me just try to remember what i was most upset i think i was most upset about something you said john um uh there's like you know you say like there's this i well i'm not sure actually most it's, it's tough to compare um i was may, maybe most provoked maybe most provoked by something you said about this idea that like blockchain people or the blockchain movement is somehow democratic 
when my experience is very different there are there's certainly some people who are into democracy and who kind of believe in like the idea and promise of democracy but there's so many people who are just like trying to secure property rights systems that like are supposed to be way outside of democratic rule because democratic rule is seen as this kind of threat to uh you know this kind of like libertarian small state vision of the world that so many people in the crypto space have just to give one camp of people who are not democratic and who dominate the space um there's there's also the uh, anarchists who for the most part are not democratic even though they might ha they might believe in democracy in some sense they don't believe in the you know, idea that like you like the democratic will controls the state, which sets the rules that people agree to and enforces them on everyone. And there's this like you know democratic legitimacy model that we see in democracies. Um, and 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 if you think about like the global international law kind of setting of the blockchain, it's like very much not democratic. There's no sense in one person one vote. There's no sense in you know, your country mattering or your people mattering in particular too much relative to others in the global kind of setting. You know, the, the, I, I, in, in my opinion, on the whole, the blockchain space is not democratic. You know, okay, maybe there are some democratic efforts, but uh, I would say it's, you know, I, I would say it's like highly legalistic as opposed to democratic. Um, um, even though the legalism is, is kind of like immutably, immutability heavy, you know, the rule of law and whether it's one flavor or another in the blockchain space, like kind of for most projects, the, you know, totally trumps any kind of democratic input, democratic sentiment that like, you know, what like, like you know, representatives of democracies like have to say, you know, like, like it doesn't really, like, it's not really like, you know, the, the most democratic project maybe is Libra because like they say they'll submit to US law and then US law is like supposedly democratic. And so maybe Libra is like the most democratic project that has like a serious like position in crypto, which is which kind of goes to show in my opinion, like how undemocratic the space is um, given like the like Zuckerberg's position in Libra. Um, so that I thought was objectionable and I, I maybe have more, but like, let's start there. I think that's, uh, and I won't keep jumping in, but Vlad, so interesting to me on a number of levels beyond just what you said. One is that, uh, so, you know, I, I share a number of things you said I share. I agree with you. One is that the, so maybe an overture tactically to speaking to a crypto law space as being towards democracy is not a move that unifies people. Right, uh, that's not an overture uh, that sort of like gets people listening. Uh, secondly, uh, we could from there, Vlad just brought up a lot of things. We'd have to map out what we we oftentimes democracy is sort of a black box for us. We sort of just say democracy, but there's actually very different theories of democracy. Mm -hmm. For example, people who believe in spontaneous order of individuals and stuff like that, they. The, the language of investment regimes and since the 90s, the international economic order, which is, you know, you know, what people talk about when they talk about neoliberalism oftentimes, speaks this language, for example, right? So, so maybe we are getting into some really messy, difficult questions. Uh, the same, we'd have to map out the different sociologies and conceptual terrain of those crypto positions. That would be fascinating to understand that a little better. And uh, uh, finally, one thing Vlad said that was very interesting to me is he proposed, and I'm glad I'm not holding you to this, but you proposed one way is that if you, some people feel that if you obey US law, that you're then being more democratic, right? Something like that. But, but US law oftentimes is just embedding a very specific way of privatization of a certain allocation of resources that is inherently unequal. So like, the, uh, let me just uh, let me just interrupt. Sorry, quick. Uh, what I was saying there is like you know I'm not trying to say that, you, that being subject to U.S. law is a democratic thing. I'm just saying like that's maybe the most democratic thing in crypto, which is to say that like crypto is not very democratic. Or, I, I hear you. But but notice that 
when we talked about uh, crypto, about many people just want individual, you know, it's a, basically an investment asset or, or something like that. They only can call that an asset. This gets back to Andrea's point, as I understand it, of when she said there's no intermediaries. Well, actually, there's tons of intermediaries, right? And the same is true, like they say, well, there's no state. And you're like, what are you talking about? You have a property right, right? You, you, you can trust this, you know, you have all these different rights that are being enforced there and that are being legislated. Like we oftentimes forget that like the central bank through interest rate policy sets prices, right? Or the way that it issues who gets to be the currency provider. Sure. But it's, but it's also not like the state can decide they don't want property anymore, but it's, it's not like the central bank can decide they don't want to do this anymore. It's not like any of these actors have any freedom in this international law to stop doing these things. Like, you know, it's, I would say like the global, the legal order associated with global financial capitalism basically forces states to recognize property, corporations, contracts, and it forces them to have central banks and it forces this kind of it forces all this. Like, it's not like any of this is like, oh, this is like thanks to legislatures. You know what I mean? These legislatures are subject to international law associated with the global financial system. And as much as they are kind of like part of it, they are, they don't like drive that system as much as like, you know, the highly connected people in the financial space do. And that's like kind of like a global space, not, you know, people who like, are like, you know, not, uh, you know, not elected representatives. Let's put so, it so I put on the table. Just hold on, hold on. Grace yeah. is coming in. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the idea of democracy is like the first thing about democracy is who's included, right? So it's easy to say whether something is democratic or not based on a geolocation, right? So if, you know, if Anya is Slovenian and I'm Slovenian, I'm not, but, we're, but if we're physically there, you can say, okay, now we know those people's rights are or aren't represented. But if you're in the blockchain space, how do you say that it's even democratic? Like how many tokens would I need to hold or would I have to have a job in the block? It's very hard to even say this is or isn't a democracy in a situation where you don't, like there's no declared membership. Yeah, I mean, and to me that just solidifies the case that it's not democratic. Um, <laughs> Um, but, uh, but, but, but definitely the, the lack of representation, the lack of clear way for people to have agency at all, like almost no matter who you are, um, I think bodes badly for the idea that this is democratic. I mean, the idea, the, the, but however it is empowering to lots of individuals and people can sometimes have a theory of democracy where it's kind of more like, um, about public power than about representation in governance. But I'm not sure, I don't know. That's um, actually, I mean, to me that opens another question, Grace. Uh, your point was well noted on my end because I'm like, okay, so what are the compounds of democracy when we are talking about crypto uh, world? What does it uh, mean? Are we still talking about one person, one vote? Or is it more or less like one organization? one vote, um, how broad is actually the crypto field? Like, are we talking about the democracy of the whole crypto? Because to me, crypto is literally just, you know, we can make digital twins of whatever we literally have. Every transaction that we make or whatever we exchange values amongst each other, it's not only the transaction that we have in monetary sense, but literally every time we exchange a value, we can now sort of create a digital twin to that. And now we're here stuck talking about democracy of a whole new world, which we just pretty much digitalized <laughs> all our aspects. So how broad do we go? I mean, I think uh, there is a, there's a thing that uh, about the initially when you mentioned the disintermediation as being something that is rhetoric that often used quite a lot. I mean, there's something else also, which is, which you mentioned that we always end up with disintermediation. So another angle could be, <clears throat> which is sometimes talked about is like de-chokification, which is like it's not bad to have me, me, meteoris because we need meteoris, but rather than the, that, that kind of value set, then it's much more interesting to say if a meteoris has some sort of monopoly events, you know, that angle. And that brings in 
instead of maybe democracy, even before understanding democracy, because democracy brings in a lot of uh, own fostering, uh, we could think of it from a stakeholder perspective. So by that, I mean, like, you know, it could be any organization or any group uh, that can affect or is affected uh, by the by the by what's happening in the crypto space that would be a stakeholder and in that case it's interesting because it doesn't always align in terms of say in regular blockchain space there's like exchanges there's people who hold their own coins there's like people who make wallets like different people have different uh power but that does not at all align with any number of coins they have so for example Somebody could just be making a software for wallets and not have any coins, but they might end up having like significantly more power than some people who have a little amount of coins, right? So even having a representational system where you could think, let's do coin-based voting or one coin, one person, or multiple coin, multiple people, wouldn't even mean like there are, there are power aspects of the system that are just nothing to do with coins with how the stakes are being held. So I think it, it, that's why to look at democracy or look at even the power from a crypto token coin base is insufficient because there's the aspects of power in crypto, which is actually not uh, materialized as crypto tokens or crypto coins. You know, so how do you, how do you capture that kind of power which is never represented? And that's, that's I mean, difficult in levels of crypto because it's not like a physical geolocation where people meet and you draw a border so this is a state or a country so it's all in the on the cyberspace so it becomes even more not just there's untapped power but there is no materiality of that power always yeah, or immediately uh, structural kind of power right yeah yeah exactly exactly so that's why that the, even the existing say stakeholder uh, mapping theories and stuff become so difficult to apply in this case because the post-structuralism of the kind of virtuality of the cyberspace that is constantly evolving, adopting, and 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 on top of that, there's a whole rhetoric which is just like, let's limit all the conversations to tokens and stuff, but crypto is much more than tokens and all the coins, right? It's kind of a gestalt in that way. So how do we, so maybe so we can... Take it's like a Pandora's box, you know, with like... Yeah, yeah. Uh, like, so I'm afraid that maybe we are approaching too fast with democracy. Maybe we just take a step back and even try to capture the kind of post structuralist um, political power angle first, yeah. even to realize. And then, because, because democracy brings a lot of agenda even on its own, which might become difficult to analyze. And, and a lot I mean, of the time people assume this kind of structural coercion as a part of de democracy, right? People kind of assume at least a lot of the time that there has to be like a way for the, uh, the people to make things, uh, to, to force outcomes. Yeah, there's kind of like, you know, there's like some mechanism by which the democratic will is enforced, you know, that, yeah. that we kind of like would, 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 are kind of like asking for when we talk about democracy, at least as, at least in my, at least, in, at least as far, so I have this kind of like structuralist fear of democracy that we're kind of talking about structuralism and we're not thinking about like, you know, the, uh, the like the power dynamics between memes, but like imagining more like, you know, this kind of like. Uh, How do you capture the, the meme power, for example? And that becomes, and the, the democracy talk kind of can become, not always it can become a kind of a justificatory past of like coercing people it's for it's for your own good so let me tell you how we organize these things you know and well, then it, so it's, not, it's, the, it's the system you know yeah but it's yeah. it depends a little bit on i think that there are two different ideas of democracy floating here at the same time so i think on the one hand um i think vlad i just picked it up when you said it right now the democratic will which in a sense is this idea that there is like one um, idea of the general will of the population that then gets enforced, so that there is still some kind of abstract idea of the good. But I think that there is another notion or another idea of democracy, which I think why it is important to talk about it is that somehow um, you, when you start your 
thinking that there is no such thing as the utopian solution. There is no dreamland that is at the end of the corridor if we just think hard enough and come up with good systems. There is, there is just um, people with different positions in the world that have different needs and they fight over their share of the pie. And in that sense, democracy is a, is a mechanism that at least on the, on the decision-making side um, tries to stay away from saying, here is the good that we are striving for, but here is a mechanism in which we try to give um, all the actors in the field the chance to bring their interest forward and to, to champion their interest. And I think that one of the big so, so questions comes to the other big thing that is not touched on this is, is economic power in many ways. So in, in how far can you have a distributive system in which people, whatever their ideas are, can champion them on a somewhat level playing field. So I think that is that is a different idea of democracy than the idea of democracy as a volonté générale that is somehow abstracted and then the state comes in as that thing that enforces that. So there's two two comments that I have. One is like, uh, I kind of have a question like, is any egal any egalitarian force democratic under the second under the second notion, even if it doesn't have this mechanism that you described? So like, imagine like some things that force sort of egalitarianism, even if it doesn't have like. Uh, um, um, a mechanism for giving people power like if you imagine no mechanism but still more like still egalitarian is that democratic i mean i mean i think it depends on so my when i hear something like this my mind travels to questions of uh, state socialism and and planned economy or something like that so in a sense you exactly. create an egalitarianism through um, a, a plan that is executed, and I think that, for me, in a sense, is, is um, um, the the extreme pole of the idea that you do um, a redistribution after a design of the good, after a design of a fairness um, idea that is that can be attainable. So I think that pinning yourself to that um, will 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 take you down a, a, a bad road. On the other hand, I don't think that the ideal type of a, um, I mean, what John just said, this like spontaneous order idea is just as problematic. So I don't think that you land on either of these extreme poles, but I think that they come with different conceptions. Okay, so but regardless of how it's done, there's a kind of egalitarian spirit to democracy, which I think, I think we can all, I think it's more or less we can all agree uh, on that. Um, and I think there's an egalitarian spirit in blockchain also, um, uh, but it's uh, kind of like equal access to being a uh, capitalist, uh, not necessarily. I am not sure about that, because if it's egalitarian or if it's participatory, because there's a lot of conversation, especially if you look at early Greek uh, philosophy, about less about egalitarianism, more about participation. Yeah. Like even the idea of Agora in like ancient places was more about participatory and like everybody being able to attend the assembly the entire city state. So yeah, I mean, and yeah. about everybody being heard. So and those are very different things. Because in Soviet state, for example, the egalitarianism was more that was Lenin's actually literal rhetoric, rhetoric that we cannot have the Soviets like the little unions and voting because we need egalitarianism by economic redistribution more so than people being able to participate in the duty process. So that's also a kind of a slippery slope of egalitarianism, you know, and yeah. I would, sorry. No, sorry, uh, go, go ahead, Grace. I would say that the, um, like, so there's this egalitarianism, and again, with what I'm working on, I, the, I would say that this egalitarian idea, at least from my perception, is I really like what um, Jordan Hall's idea of fuck you money. It's like, if everybody has enough money to say, no, I'm not going to clean your toilets, then, then you have some, some way of expressing yourself. Like it, egalitarian, you can express your voice if you're not afraid of losing your job, losing your food, losing your rent. And I don't think that, um, and so this like complete like socialist redistribution of everything and there should be more equality financially isn't necessary. But I do think that, there, that in order to have an egalitarian society, everybody has to have enough money to say, no, I, I won't take that job. You know, I won't be a prostitute or I won't whatever because I have enough money to at least speak my voice in a way 
that has some integrity for myself. And I think without that, you can't really have democracy. So it's not exactly egalitarianism, but like as if there's like sort of a bottom level at which if, if you're below that level, democracy is kind of like a, it's a, it's a fake because you can't actually express your preferences even in a free market because you don't have enough money to even express your real preferences in a free market because you're just so, you can't get by. And so even the market signals are corrupted uh, when people don't have, you know, like the amount of money you pay for somebody to clean your, you know, to, to be a cleaning person is very low because nobody in those, you know, so the economic signals, even the capitalist signals are corrupted if people don't have that minimum. And that's a, a corruption of democracy in every way, I would say. I, I think uh, a lot of the discussion so far seems to be about uh, like political democracy rather than I think something that's also really interesting in this context is about uh, economic democracy. So democracy within workplaces, within uh, business organizations or other forms of organization as well. And I think the reason why that's interesting is uh, in this context is because while um, you know, in political democracy, when in the discussions we've had so far, we really emphasize uh, the idea that, okay, one person has one vote and, um, you know, th 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 this is great, but, and can be used, you know, at a, a, during certain election cycles. But when we go into our workplaces and we come back into our master servant relationships within our workplaces, we end up uh, often losing um, this quality and uh, sort of, it, subjecting ourselves to um, a more autocratic system. And so, you know, a lot of those people, a lot of people who are interested in economic democracy, look at the idea that, well, for those eight or 10 hours that you're working, you shouldn't suddenly, you know, be out of this democratic space. And so what would it be like to have a system where we can have um, one person, one vote within our organizations as well? And I think here, uh, Blockchain, I think, can be really interesting as well, because if you look at this research over several decades into labor managed firms, into worker cooperatives, I'm coming at this from a slightly different angle than what Anuj was saying about uh, the Soviet Union. But even um, when you, in a capitalist society, you create a labor managed firm uh, where it's democratically controlled, you have um, certain really exciting potential because you're saying, okay, we're challenging the shareholder value maximization norm by creating a, a membership owned organization. But at the same time, uh, it has to go further than this. How do we build uh, a, uh, an organization that can go beyond five people or 10 people like uh, maybe another, like an organization today, uh, how we're speaking with each other. Uh, how can it re remain democratic after it scales? How do we deal with uh, issues of income disparity, like what Grace was mentioning? Uh, the way that cooperatives have been, worker cooperatives have been dealing with this is by putting an income cap, right? Like saying that the highest paid can only be five times more uh, wealthy than the lowest paid. So the janitor will only get a five times less than the CEO, not a hundred times or 500 times more. Uh, what's interesting, I think about this is what can blockchain contribute to this? One of the, uh, and, and why I see some of these interesting discussions about this. What, one of the issues with worker cooperatives is that it, um, is that you lose the interest of members as it grows because they say that, well, each vote becomes less valuable. Um, as we go from being 10, 15 to being 100 or 500. Could uh, the fact that, let's say, um, the, the, the transparency value of blockchain help contribute to saying, okay, well, I know um, what my share of voting power is. I have a greater understanding of what are the issues that the organization is facing. And I'm not just relying on certain benevolent dictators, to use a term uh, we had yesterday in our, our panel. I think that's the, one of the areas where um, we can look at democracy in a different way with and try to think about what are the pros and cons of using blockchain as well. I think, I mean, the thing I would uh, not object, but I would maybe, I mean, I, I agree, but I would criticize that uh, maybe you're not saying that, but we shouldn't try to measure or uh, even confirm if democracy happens by looking at the kind of the formal side of it, the formal final phase of the voting. Because there's a lot of democracy, as you know, which happens like out on the street when you're protesting, right? It's not like you're literally voting or you are, or the, even the capacity to argue or to 
Jews in law or whatever, right? First Amendment and all that. So, so th which is a huge part of democracy, which we all live in. We have like lived democracy, where it's not, uh, it doesn't show, like it's difficult to show people democracy is happening because nobody's voting. And, and this has been hijacked, as you know, by like right-leaning, neoliberal, fascist-loving, saying that, okay, we just let you vote every four or five years. This is the time, just shut the fuck up and don't go on manifestation or like protest and stuff. You would ban it. And this is the problem if we, if you look at and how to even represent or enable that crypto, that kind of non-voting, but a more kind of a, I don't know how to put it, like a kind of fluid, social, like a argumentative way of uh, enacting living. It's super important and super difficult because as you said, that, that, that kind of structuralist approaches to making that happen, say the very fact of going on the street, for example, uh, it's it's very difficult to do on Twitter. I mean, there's meme magic and stuff people do to kind of make these things happen, but that is not limited to everybody to do that, right? So, and most people are not don't even have the, let's say the cyber or the digital education to to even step up and participate in a way on the ongoing process of influencing decisions. So, so this is why I think. How do we capture that? I'm curious. And also another thing at the beginning where you differentiated between political democracy and economic democracy. I'm curious to know how you're making the difference. Is it based on the way we measure the democracy? Or is it, uh, because I'm, I'm afraid the moment we move too much into representing democracy in economic terms, in terms of the money, coins, whatever, there is, uh, you know, it, it is gameable in terms of plutocracy and stuff. So. Uh, so this is why I'm just I'm asking, like, what do you what do you think on that? Uh, I'm guessing you, 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 you're asking me this. I think. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think that the, the, the distinction is basically in the fact that um, while it is widely accepted that uh, in you know uh, in Western democracies that you know a worker is a citizen and they can. Uh, exercise their voting rights with a lot of caveats, given the sort of obstacles we are see, uh, we're seeing about workers exercising their franchise. Um, the idea is is that while this is considered a virtue and is considered, you know, um, a norm within these democracies, when it comes to the workplace, it isn't a norm. And that uh, we see, I mean, like the examples of this are so common that I wouldn't know where to begin uh, with this. I think the idea though is that the, the distinction being that once you enter into your workplace, you're not considered a citizen a or a member of a democracy anymore. And this um, is, I guess, like basically going from being uh, a part of your social contract in the state to becoming part of an employment contract. Uh, and you have like, I think, I think you and I talked about this before with respect to David Graeber, like everyone from David Graeber to David Ellerman uh, has written about this as well, but I think that's really um, the place where I would, I think the, the, the where the distinction arises. Do we yeah, follow I mean, up on? The I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Like, just to keep this going, just to uh, cycle this through. I had uh, two questions. One is, anyone who hasn't sort of weighed in yet or has been sitting there sort of thinking if they wanted to jump in, and secondly to Grace, just to, to incorporate your question still very, I'm wondering how Morshed in, in the comments has asked you, what happens if someone says, well, how do you pay for it? It's gonna to lead to inflation. It's gonna be inefficient. How, how, do you, how do you respond to those sort of challenges? The monetary system is outdated. The entire monetary system, we're seeing it right now. Like money as a construct is just a construct because it's imaginary. And this whole thing, like we're in this huge Ponzi scheme where we always have more debt than we can ever pay off. And it's just gotten 10 to have an economic crisis. It's, it's not working. And so this like, what about inflation? We need to find substitutes for the monetary system. And urgently, like really, it's falling apart. And that's where blockchain has been uh, quite problematic because it we have the potential to reimagine value. Money isn't a store of value, it's a store of something. But like the things we value the most, air, water, relationships are not represented by money. 
So like these questions only makes of like, what about inflation? And what about free riders only makes sense inside the particular monetary system construct that we have right now, which is failing everywhere. So like that's kind of a wider discussion, but it really is interesting. Like we have created all this automation, which supposedly should make us all be able to work three hours a day and still have enough food and shelter, but somehow we're all working twice as much, making half as much. I mean, like the whole system is so bonkers right now that it, it like even answering those questions, like, like we, it, it boggles the mind. Um, and how much we talk about money like air, like, oh, well, we need money to live. Well, no, it's not like air. We invented it. And so we really need to have a major rethink about how these systems work. And instead of creating employment, create universal basic food, like it would be pretty simple to have food systems that are like our um, that are like our health systems, like a supermarket where there's a free aisle and so nobody starves. And like, there's pretty simple constructs you could do to start making steps in that direction away from this monetary system um, or uh, something that would go along in parallel to solve some of these basic problems. Because inflation is just a number on a spreadsheet and money is just a number on a spreadsheet. Like it's, the reality is, did somebody have a meal or not? So I, I feel like we need to have, now that we have, we have computer systems now that can really measure those things. Money really made a lot of sense when we weren't able to see so much of what's really going on, um, like the employment rate or the gross national product. But like those made sense when you couldn't say, hey, look, I can see if somebody actually ate, right? I can see if actually somebody went to the supermarket in the last week. And, and, and have a measure of the thing I really care about. So I think that we're just inside of an outdated thinking model and uh, it's really hard to imagine what that's gonna look like, but there's a lot we can do with cryptocurrency that we just haven't been able to do. And uh, by the way, the powers that be don't like that kind of conversation, but it is inevitable. I think there's a, uh, something that happens often, like you know when we were talking about that, we 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 completely uh, do not argue about democracy when we're in the public space, but the moment we're in a private space, like working for somebody, we kind of just kind of you know like yeah that's a nice idea, but it doesn't apply here. For some reason we are all okay with that uh, for some weird reason, and if somebody tries to unionize or something, there are people in the company that have what you can do here, right? So I think there's the kind of a uh, lack of imagination or even the ontological permission we give to each other, where it's like, just because it's private space, it's my property, like whoever is the CEO of the shareholders, it's like their world garden, and we should be so grateful that they're even letting us, you know, do some work, so they are just giving us money, you know? And, and so that's why it's weird when we look at blockchains or crypto as a network, because it is like everybody has their, you can argue their property in terms of coins, and there are many people, many stakeholders who don't even have that, but have equally, if not more influence or are influenced, they need to be represented. But at the same time, it is not the network as a whole. It's not like a single company or group of companies. It's not a private space. So democracy makes all that more sense. So it's a kind of a weird space where I think we need a way, we need to free ourselves to be able to imagine like the Ethereum space, for example, as neither private nor public, because the moment we think of public, we think of like, okay, it's state. Yeah. So it's still some sort of a private, it belongs to this state. The state is kind of like the owner, like France is the owner of all the public parks, kind of like Japan cannot come and take ownership, for example, unless they have a treaty or something. So, but in the case of crypto, it's neither that there's nobody home really who owns the entire Ethereum space, right? So. So at the same time, I think to even to have democracy a possibility, we need to maybe even be able to imagine what is it that this space is not private, of course not, not public, but something else. And if we are able to do that, then we can also imagine how to make all these voices and all these power structures more visible, not visible, like more representable in some ways. So decisions could be made, you know, not just in terms of, as Grace wonderfully said, 
money uh, which is which i think in some ways as long as we are in crypto and we still use money it's like we are underutilizing crypto right you are still using a old world mechanism to see something that i think is pushing us to reinvent the way we imagine yeah i don't know. i don't know if that makes sense what i'm what i'm saying so I, I have a provocation just to ask people, and I'd be interested in... Wait, wait, wait. I want to jump in. Sorry, I'm sorry, Black. Go for it. Um, so the main thing about this conversation that has been bothering me is kind of the lack of legal perspective and legal language and legal analysis and notions of, like, even the idea that, like, for example, like, uh, uh, democracy can have illegitimate will or illegitimate, or like, or, like, that people could be empowered and then do unlawful stuff and that it could be bad, you know, not, not just bad, but like, you know, um, like, uh, you know, like um, unlawful. And the, the idea of like legal due process and making decisions like never came, never really came up. You know, the, the idea of like people's legal positions never really came up. It's always, it was kind of like political and economic. And even this, this, this whole conversation of democracy has kind of like, done this thing that really bothers me about democracy which is kind of like act as if it's not a subject of the rule of law and it doesn't have this kind of high legal standard of like you know uh like subjecting things to an incredible amount of like scrutiny and dispute and you know conflict constantly from many different perspectives um you know it's kind of like and I think, the, and, 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 and I think that's also kind of related to this kind of like anti-democratic feeling that I get from blockchain space where, pe where people are kind of, you know, they, 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 they think these systems are legitimate regardless of um, these kind of, it's, it's effects on democracy or people's uh, political, economic power, position, et cetera. So maybe I can I can respond to this. This is, I think it's a good impulse, Vlad, to to go back to law. And I think that in a sense, the way this spins out in my mind is very much. If I give you an example, we talk we say law in general, and then we think about. Um, I have a good friend who works on waste law, and so what kind of international laws govern waste? And the beautiful example that or the paper that he um, presented is is um, very striking because. What he says is if we look at where the profits go structured through legal rights, then they all accumulate to the top in one in the in the profit in, in the pockets of few. If we look at who needs to bear the responsibility for things going wrong or for negative sides, we see that environmental law spreads the responsibility throughout the public. So you have in the very broad conception, depending on different areas in which you look, different mechanisms that are built into legal design and that are safeguarded by rights. And I mean, if you boil this down really into one thing, you can think of the right to property. And you can see how the right to property has very different valencies and very different effects in, in a different context. So where on the one hand, the right to property might be something that you really want to uphold if you uh, think of a little farmer um, who has like his house there for 20 years and the state says, I want to buy, a, I want to build a highway here. And then you refer to property and you, you go to a property right, which is a democratic right in many constitutions. And you celebrate it and you say, I'm going to use this language of the property right to, 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 um, to protect this uh, farmland or indigenous people's um, lands. I mean, you can go into all sorts of examples where the right to property has been invoked in a very progressive way. But then you have the same thing where you see um, in international investment law and international economic law, the right to property means that the foreign investment company will have to be compensated for its uh, lost earnings when you build a national park and this company happens to have whatever a, a building on it and the building will be teared down you don't only pay compensation for that building you have to actually pay the state pays compensation to this company for the lost profits that this enterprise would have made in the next i don't know how many years Mm -hmm. so, and this is an international law norm, right? This is an yeah. This is a this is yeah. Investment law is an international legal regime that has this really uh, strong protection of foreign property. 
So it's so so it is an international law norm. That doesn't mean it applies everywhere. It's not a customary law norm, but it's in treaties. So it depends on the relationship. But but in in general, I mean, the point I think to make here is that I am personally I am a firm believer that there is a progressive power in law, and I do think that you are right that we need to think about how is this legal position designed and what is in it? So what is the right of a citizen? How is this a good position? What else should be in there? But Do I think- the right to be really, really regressive just because of like conservative ideology, for example. You know, like there's kind of like, um, you know, I, I personally think the law is actually much more, much more progressive than democracy. I mean, it can like really I think it, it really it can be it depends on who is who is using it if you think of the civil rights movement of course you would say well this is something where where law has been in in service of of a cause um, and it, it's not just that it's in service as a tool as a hammer I mean it has a, a particular structure to it that um, that allows for for um, um, claims to be made in a way that that go but I just think that it, I, I wouldn't go so far to say that rights are more progressive than democracy because rights can have the exact opposite um, 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 way to go if you- The law is not rights. But even rights, I mean, rights is also property rights. If you read this book by yeah, Katarina but, 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 but I'm not talking about rights, we're talking about law, right? And I mean, law is also going to limit rights and freedoms and, you know, uh, especially, especially in cases where people don't have like the moral responsibility to use their rights in a way that like is kind you're, of... You're saying that you're, you're referring to natural rights, but an idea of something called natural rights? Uh, no, I mean, I'm implicitly, whenever you talk about morality and law, natural law is like implicit, but I'm not like referring to natural law when, I, when I'm doing that. What rights do you have before a regime is put in place that allocates and provides for it? Can you give me a concrete example of a? I mean, I mean, I mean, what law is there without uh, without a regime that comes in and allocates it? In your opinion, I don't. I don't think there is. Okay. Well, I could not disagree more. Um, I, in fact, I would say that, like the like even the system that will uh, supposed to be coming come in and like you know like establish law is itself subject to law and can't conduct itself freely can't even close to say can you give me like, can you give me uh, I, I, I know you're gonna go there i, I just can't help I mean, provoking take, you take, let's take this example. example that we just talked about about the um you know the, uh, the the property rights in international law it's a great example where like you know the state can't really um there's like there's basically no way for the state to to not respect corporations contracts and property in international law today i mean it's basically you have to uh ostracize yourself from um the the kind of glo global economic um kind of i don't want to say system uh let's say from a lot of the ecosystem no yeah, that's much better um, you have to isolate yourself from a lot of the ecosystem if you want to like not have property rights, not have contract law, not have corporate law. Um, and it's, it's not like corporate law contracts, property rights, um, you know, exist thanks to the, um, the, the th th thanks, thanks to like a formal legal system. Um, you know, these are, these are, these are, um, natural law forms. I mean, you're begging, you're asking for the natural law analysis, but so Vlad, I would, to do it. I, I, I get the idea. I would, um, like, uh, you know, I enjoy these conversations. Like my sense is that the global economic, whatever is itself, uh, you know, very much grounded in, uh, complex jurisdictional regimes. And so when we say like banks are capitals international when it lives and it's national when it dies, if we change limited liability, you know, vehicles of companies, it completely changes corporate structures. If we, you know, these background rules are all existing there. There are no private- You don't change them by, with, with like legislature in your national, in your nation state. No, yes, you, you do. do. So for no. example, I'll give you an example. Okay. The central, I mean, here's an example. The central bank, right? Uh, which, you know, sets a lot of monetary policy and frames a lot of stuff and enters liquidity and shapes a lot of our economic order was licensed in 1913. And we could imagine, or the Bank of London, that was a choice to go to private creditors as a way of money creation. 
and that was in, in, you know, substantiated through society passing laws and all that. So I just, and like when limited liability companies came up, it completely changed what economically you could do. Or when mortgages came up in the United States, it completely yeah, but, changed. But these, the these things weren't invented by legislatures. They were invented by, you know, people in like, like who are who, in like these deep kind of legalistic, economic, political positions who kind of saw the opportunity for this form and 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 and, it was, and saw the kind of like need for it um and you know they they didn't like it's not like it was uh arbitrary it, it was like the result of the rule of like a rule of law kind of so well, this is this this argument uh, this or not a rule of law but like a legal process or not process but of, of law capital l as in the as in the discipline of law, not as in like the 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 thing that the discipline is concerned with, but like the you know the, the discipline of law produces these things, and it doesn't do it kind of like uh, like willy nilly, and it can't really like you can't like force. I mean, so let me put it this way: Imagine you wanted to do something illegal with the state, like in my opinion, like the discipline of law and the and law itself will e either stop you, sanction you, punish you, or you'll like live forever in fear, like this kind of stuff, like, those, you know, like normal law stuff. Um, and, um, you know, like, it, and I think this like posture that like, oh, look, the system just decides what, whatever, what law is, and then like, if we come up with better law, and we, we just like make it, like, 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 make it happen through the system is like, only really true if it survives this legal scrutiny which is kind of like super a super duper high bar that like basically almost nothing can make it through and so you know even so so and, and even if you were to try say like you know let it legislate something if it's if it's bullshit quite frankly like it's not going to matter in international law you know you can kind of play pretend but no one's really gonna it's not really gonna affect the legal order I, I find I, I'm it a, so. I'm a... oh, sorry. Grace. Sorry, Grace. No, no, no. Go ahead. I mean, I just find it so interesting that you know how how you separate this thing out. Like, if you try to do something that's illegal, you're going to get punished with the state. And and we're just seeing evidence that that's completely untrue. Like, the system isn't the legal system isn't resilient. Okay, but, 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 but... and it, it's just in front of our faces, like that this is so tied into capital and power it's, that the legal system is fails. Legal systems, really. Like law is not legal systems. Like uh, legal systems are, you know, associated with law and make the law look bad. But, uh, and, and, and so do like, you know, formal designations of illegal in legal systems, which often are kind of, you know, just like they designate lawful stuff as illegal all the time. And it's just, and it's ridiculous. Um, I'm um, sorry, 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 uh, sorry to interrupt. So in what way do you mean, like, I'm curious what, in what way do you mean that the legal, that the law is more resilient? Because there's this law, but it's not enforced. Like, how, in what way do you mean that it's more resilient? Yeah, so, than so, so for example, there are norms, legal norms, really important legal norms of good faith, reasonable uh, judgment. Uh, and for example, uh, um, yeah, I mean, those are, I, I usually have another one. But anyways, those are those are two really good examples of important legal norms of a good faith and my and like reasonable, clear judgment. And, 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 and those norms are not enforceable. You know, you can't define what it is to be reasonable or to have good faith. You can't like set out the processes that have to be followed to, to do these things. They're actually, it's, it's actually impossible to reduce good faith or reasonable judgment to process or system it, like will never happen and, and but these norms are are, are are like rooted and like law is rooted in these norms much more than it's rooted in the idea that like we'll do whatever the system says and i mean and it's actually unlawful to do whatever the system says and actually you know you might as well be saying that genocide is okay if the system says it's okay i mean it's like that like that level of of, of disrespect for the rule of law to act like you know the state the, makes law when really like, you know, the state is uh, kind of like a, a legal person that is created by law and is governed by law. And it's like, 
and is not in a position to dominate law or to be used by like people with power to make do do what they want with the law you know that's really clear thank you and of course right when it's starting to heat up and we could really start it's so nice that people feel safe enough to argue like it's great to experiment and argue and push each other uh uh in that spirit we're out of time i think we're almost out of time we're what time we have 15 more minutes John. Ooh, wonderful i'm sorry so uh how do we want to do this Andrea, where where are you at? What have you been thinking? No, I think that it's very interesting. I mean, I do think that uh, these are like we we drifted into a very fundamental conversation about um, legal theory, and and I mean, um, well, Vlad, any time, let's have a picnic and talk about this because I think it's really in many ways I I fall in a very different position than you fall. I am not a a believer in good reason and and uh, um, in reason and good faith. I literally. Um, just literally wrote a paper about how exactly these two notions were invoked to protect foreign company assets from redistribution in a newly independent state. Like literally those were, I, I mean, it, I, it couldn't be more to the point that it was exactly yeah. these and, two. And, 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 and honestly, like in terms of, in terms of law, like I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm super happy to have this fight, you know, because like to me, the yeah, like, you know, trying to suspend with good faith and, and legal judgment is basically like the worst thing you could do. <laughs> well, no, but the, the point is not that you want to suspend those notions. The point is that those notions will be will be interpreted in a way that they fit the the game, and you can interpret them in either way. You can say it is every the single legal level. form is going to be abused. Like every legal form is going to be abused. Like you can't give me a legal so this form. Is, so this abused. is why, but this is exactly why um, you, I would disagree with you to land on something like a natural law idea that there are some things that are just fundamental because it doesn't mean anything as long as they are not being interpreted within an institutional setting. So I, I don't, you know, actually I really, I, I, I think that I could be completely agnostic toward the question of whether the idea of, of uh, reason could have a natural law status or not, because whatever, it, it will I mean, come it down does. to uh, a setting in which it will be interpreted. But what is what I think is is um, the more let's fundamental let's thing is- take, Let's just take, wait a second, let's just take interpretation. It's like a great setting. It's like a perfect setting to talk about because like, you know, there, like if you think about like the law that regulates your interpretation of this sentence, it's not really the kind that you are thinking of in terms of institutional setting that will like it will where where that law is interpreted and enforced. I mean, the way that you interpret my words is almost outside of your control. It's much more governed by forms that are not, you know, in this kind of like interpretation and enforcement legal setting. And if you think about like the evolution of legal arguments and what arguments people take as legitimate at different times, you know, this isn't a matter of just interpretation in some institutional setting. It's a deep cultural thing that's way outside of your corporation and your yeah, institution. But it depends yeah. on what you take as institution. I would I would merge those two points into one. I would say the cultural, the deep cultural thing is precisely the institutional setting and you can go into law and sociology and Look at different things there, but well, I think I mean, then, 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 then it's much more about like people's experience and kind of the like actual experience of being part of society than any kind of like structuralist reduction to system or institution or this like bit of dead things over there or those dead things over there. You know, it's about like the like hey, real hey guys, life. If I may jump in real quick here. Uh, uh, Oh. I, 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 I just learned about this meeting, so I'm really jumping just in the middle, but I feel I can really relate to both of your, point, your points. And, and uh, Shebnam and I are working on, on, a, on a presentation, on a document that may help facilitate these things, because the, the, the dialogue that you two are having, um, I, I, I'll try to make this as brief as possible, but basically this has been done. Uh, by an inductive study from Talcott Parsons uh, in the last century, where he looked at how people clustered together in their assessment of the questions that you're discussing. And then uh, his protege basically looked at what kind of assumptions go into whether people assume one, one perspective, one interpretation, 
over another and di they identified different principles what they call the the mode of ethical reasoning and it's this kind of it's basically a guiding principle that you apply for your sense making which then ends up generating one particular value system as a philosophy over another and flat what i what i hear you're saying is very consistent with uh, how many lawyers and, and legal theorists today uh, approach approach the law um I would say almost from a postmodern perspective of basically, look, the law is just a bunch of rules and you can use them any possible way. And, you know, depending on what you feel like you use it to do one thing or another thing. Whereas what Andrea is speaking out for natural law is basically saying like, no, 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 there is, there are general principles that are natural for all law that are intrinsic to law that are, uh, that, that are actually needed to facilitate uh, the evolution of life. You know, that's basically the theory that comes from uh, the Scottish enlightenment and, and runs actually very, very deep in the original U.S. Constitution, and and so, you know, that principle is uh, one particular mode of reasoning. And if we assume a different mode of reasoning, which you seem to do, flat, then th there's inconsistency. So basically, you need to take this on a meta level uh, to resolve yeah, which mode you want to prefer. And so. Sorry, sorry, to interrupt. I, I'm just too too triggered. No, I, I I I go as far as to say that like to to you have to maintain judgment above all principles because any principle in has a judgment can find a counter example where that principle should be violated for a, a lawful decision, and so you know to to me like judgment is a much higher order faculty than rules principles, um, you know like theory analysis. Uh, uh, can never really reach like uh, uh and and so you know the idea of like legal judgment reasonable and good faith kind of tap into this kind of like higher level, level cognitive faculties that could never be reduced to things like rules or principles and, and, yes, and I, I i agree i agree with, guys, with the, guys, the point, guys, this, guys, position this is, that you're taking gentlemen hey this is super interesting sure. this is this is it we've got six minutes left uh, right. Just before we, ah, uh, right? But like, uh, we're going to keep this going for another three days. And and hopefully we, I'm really sorry to be fascistic. Just before we go, we had a number of call, Fabian uh, and a few other colleagues just joined us and was wondering if each of you could share like who you are, where you're coming from, uh, just so that we don't lose you from the community before this gets shut down. Is that cool? Fabian, you could start, and then uh, and you and then I'll, we could pass it off to. We have uh, Tamara, and we have Julia, and Felix, and Kamaris. Would that be okay to to give them Absolutely. the the last word in the last five minutes? And then we'll keep this argument going because this is. I mean, this could be hours, right? Like, there's a lot here. I'm sorry, for first, that. Felix. First that, Fabian, the floor is yours. I want to say, you know, I'm super happy to have walked into this. This seems an amazing room and, and, and the discussion is, is very, very dear to me. So sorry for kind of jumping in on this. Um, I'm Fabian. My background is originally in computer science. I then specialized more towards information theory and uh, and uh, particle theory from, from physics, which is closely related to information theory. That's kind of the formal education. Uh, in my, my personal interests, uh, my background is in martial arts, which took me into Eastern philosophy and then more towards yoga and, and various Eastern systems. And these to me kind of fuse on the ones of information theory and then aspects of consciousness. And my current focus is on one side, notions of stability, which can be derived intrinsically. So not by pegging to some external, you know, not building platforms on the Titanic. And the other topic is exactly what we kind of are on it right now, basically figuring out how can we build a general interface for ethical modes of reasoning that then can give uh, give access to any particular mode of expressions or reasoning or, or preference systems to basically uh, achieve a compatibility among the multiple perspectives. So that's kind of in short. Thanks so much. Wow, that sounds cool. Uh, Julia, hey. Yeah, hi, good morning. Sorry I'm late, everybody. It's taken me a while to get set up. Um, I am 60. I come from a working class background in Manchester, England. So I was brought up in like what would be a project in America, but is a council estate in England. Um, and, I've, and I've got a PhD and several degrees, which I've mostly paid for myself. 
I teach, I'm a teaching assistant or a teacher at the University of Manchester now. And my last degree was in law and it, and it virtually drove me mad, ended me being, turning me crazy into a really, I mean, seriously losing my serious mental health and sense of reality because they were trying to persuade me about the nature of the world, which I thought was wrong. And I'm particularly, one, Carlos, I'm particularly struck with what you said, because that's, you, you said about law having no meaning and just being a joke. Well, that is exactly what working class communities in England think. It's a piss take, okay? That's what it's a piss take. And because it doesn't protect them, they get no protection, it does penalise them and punish them, and it locks up, you know, what, let's see, 85,000 people who are mostly people, poor people, black people, young people, men. So, I know, but going back to Vlad's point, I know we need law. I need protecting. I need, I need help because it's really frightening to be on your own in this. So, but, and again, I think back to Fabian's point, to look for a, an ethical reasoning, a more humane way of doing it, a, and as a 60 year old, I feel it's important for me to say to, to younger people, you know what, you're not on your own with this. Actually, undergraduate law students, you're not crazy, you're fine. Stick with your justice, stick with your beliefs, stick with not trusting what you're being taught and challenge it. So that, sorry, John, that's me. Sorry, Andrew, sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. Amazing, Thanks, thank Julia. you so much. Hey, Tamara. Do we have Tamara in the house? So while Tamara B chooses whether or not to join us on the microphone, we also have uh, Kamas or Felix. Hi. I'm, I'm opening my video, if you can see me. So yeah, I, I just found out about this in the last minute, now in the big of chat, um, I thought, why not join and see uh, what, what you're at? Um, so I basically, yeah, I studied uh, business and economics in Vienna and so started to get interested in blockchain governance while I was looking for a topic for a master thesis and was exploring the topic, kind of scratching the surface back, back at that time, I, I would say, finding about, uh, out about the principles, forking and things like that. And I would say I was previously very much leaning more towards state interference in terms of economics. I was super fascinated about the subjects, critical about the financial system um, and then things, as, I guess, especially uh, having, having studied after the financial crisis. Um, but more and more, I would say, I, I kind of went further into the direction of, of free markets again, or kind of thinking that there, there is a lot of merit in, in free markets. And, but I think we still need some, uh, some let's say, yeah, of course, some protect, yeah, basically uh, protecting the weak uh, with the power of the law, kind of having redistribution to some extent. I think, uh, for example, tax competition, I'm quite critical of, of, of that and where, where basically jurisdictions are being played out uh, against each other. It's, it's a double-edged sword to some extent because you can say um, if you if you have a strong state, it's, it's also just basically very. It, it can it can be quite inefficient. Um, but okay, not, not uh, going going further in, into that direction. I'm um, i I'm still quite hopeful that we we have a very interesting and more efficient institutions with, with with blockchains here, where basically I think well, I, I I I try to frame it in a paper that uh, I released um, in, in, in August, um, basically saying it's, it's kind of like a contestable market where you have um, in, in basically in the online markets and in other markets where you have strong network effects, a situation of, of a natural monopoly. And, and by having um, kind of the, the platforms or markets that are being created, governed by open source code by having, giving any, anyone the opportunity to fork, you kind of make this situation of the natural monopoly uh, contestable. Maybe that's, um, I don't know if the term is very common here, um, but 
uh, I think probably all of you have kind of heard about or thought about this this notion. Um, of course, yeah. I think the, there are many, many open questions still left for me to, to see whether um, something that might evolve towards uh, some like some truly automated system. And I think that is criticizing that to a large extent that uh, that we cannot rely on some basically uh, personless automated system that governs ourselves. That's basically not um, where, where human reasoning is, is basically not taken into account. Um, there's, yeah, I think that's that's a very, very valid point and I don't have the answers, but very curious to, to talk and learn more. And I'm currently with a venture fund investing in the blockchain space in, in Berlin. You read my question, I was about to ask. Uh, to wrap it up, could I turn it back to Andrea and uh, for the final word? Cool, cool, I wanted to, so because I really want to say to everyone who has come in after we started, that the the setup for this talk for this for this session was really to try and have people tell us or tell each other what their assumptions are what they think that other people's assumptions are what is wrong about that how that works so i think in that sense um it was a very successful session because it was very open debate so i think that the the, the fact that people disagree that you can have discussion that you can have debate was precisely the point of the session there's no idea to uh, put forward this is here the right answer and you need to listen it's much rather um, um, an exchange place for ideas so i really hope that we can continue with this in the next days because um yeah that is that is what we're here for so thank you everyone for for participating and thank you everyone for for being so open and generous and sharing your your um, thoughts and and ideas perfect thank you guys so much we're going to be kicked out of the room yet thank you, but <laughs> but join tomorrow and don't forget to sign up so that you get all the emails from us and the links Bye, thanks, Where do we guys. Sign up? Bye. Bye, bye, bye. Thank you. Super happy to walk in here. All right. See you guys tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye. Thanks for your comments, Fabian. Very interesting. Pleasure. I'm totally saving the chat today because this was yeah. incredible. Can you, can you share the chat with us after this? Somewhere? I think so. Yeah. Alisa. Yeah. Thanks. Are we able to send the chat to everybody? Um, how are we storing that? Um, yeah, we should be able to send it. I think it's, um, uh, too. yeah, just make sure it's the, uh, the public chat so that if anyone wrote private messages and stuff that they're not like, you know, so actually, like, Hey Vlad, I can't stand Anya. Oh, there she goes talking again. You know, that's the, if you, if you want, you can just, you can just, um, you should see, um, an ellipsis on the side of file. You should be able to just save the chat yourself. I don't think uh, if you're not a co-host, I don't think you have that option. Oh, then I'll share it. Um, where's the best place to connect to you? I ended up in this because Shannon told me about it. Um, I don't know where you said, you know, register, get contact. I don't know where. Right. All right. So we should totally share the link with you. Wait a second. Yeah. I'm going to be sharing the Negotiating the New Normal. It's the negotiatingthenewnormal.com. Um, okay. And welcome, Mabaro for joining here we go and is there a way to contact the people on this chat who i don't know after this like how is it like because the chat well, will no. die for you and you, we actually have a speaker's whatsapp um you can also just join the future love whatsapp group like the same let's share the link oh, okay. but for that you actually have to have the whatsapp you guys have it i have, have what so i have one Emily, what do you use? Fabian, I think we more or less like use the Telegram. Yeah, like, I, I just sent my number in the chat, which is WhatsApp, Telegram, whatever you guys prefer. Cool. Are you in the tokens engineering though? Yes, how I am. You, yeah, because I think Marina was telling me something about you and Sebnam and how uh, you guys are working with Angela. Yeah, we. I mean, I, I basically just ended up randomly last week in, in in the group, and it really took off. And we've been, you know, close to twenty four seven uh, rolling, and and uh, yeah, it's been really, really amazing. And but a little bit head over heels at times. Awesome.
I think I'm so going to be putting a message to Zargon as well because it would be incredible having him in the conversations for governance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I absolutely love Zargon. I, I met him in, in Cambridge earlier this year and uh, yeah, they're absolutely amazing. That's how I ended up in Token Asian place from meeting him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and so if there's a recording of this that I could review basically the beginning of the session, that would also be super amazing. Um, so. Yeah, it will be available, not yet today, because um, we have a lot of videos going on. It's yeah. a virtual summit, just, so just give it as an expression. But yeah, cool. it will be available to everybody. Yeah. So, the All right. labs, so the labs were still in conversation about whether whether that's for members or general, right? Like Right. So the labs stuff. are for, uh, yeah, it's, if you are a master, if you have purchased a master ticket, but then again, um you do have a couple of tickets to distribute um so do i so yeah we're good the only, the only reason is that uh in these like lab sessions have to be careful about not having the recording uh necessarily public oh but, yeah, yeah it's not uh, going to be published yeah, yeah. it's not because be of certain stakeholders we have to be careful let's say yeah a little bit differently you don't call. want donald trump to listen to our conversation yeah, they just they have to be just yeah yeah. So, uh, but uh, hey, so it's almost fun. Like we need to have these like happy hour opportunities afterwards, where some of us can break off and just keep talking. Almost now, like I want to hear Fabian and Anuj, uh, like you know, talking with each other, and I want to uh, find out who this Abaro is. Right? It's like it feels like we're just getting going again. Just I want to hear Vlad reason. argue more. You know. Elisa, are you still with us? I'm here. All right. So can we stop the recording? Um, and I'll have sure. to leave. But is there a possibility to leave this room open so that people can catch up? Or are we having something else being played here? You have another session that you need to get to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll be here. I, hopefully. I mean, I'll be here most days. Uh, uh, but I mean.